time we went, we walked out on the water. In fact, somebody said, like Peter, you walked out on the water. And we did. It was ice all the way across. But we had a wonderful time. But we're so glad to be back. I want to introduce somebody to you who's going to come and share. Uh, our students will be uh, attending the Fine Arts Nationals. And uh, Benjamin Adugiamfi is going to be uh, performing, or not performing, but ministering a short sermon. He was a Junior Merit Award winner, 11 years old, 6th grade in Smith Middle School. Would you welcome him as he comes to share us with a word today? Bless you, man. Good morning, everybody. My name is Benjamin Adujunki from, well, Raceville Church, and today I'm going to be doing my short sermon. How many of you just hate waiting? You have to wait for things all the time. It can be a ride at an amusement park, concert tickets, Christmas morning, or even the little typing icon when somebody is texting you. Sometimes, waiting can feel like an eternity, especially when it's something we really, really want. Has anyone ever made you a promise that you wouldn't have to wait for? Maybe they promised to give you something, do something for you, help you with something, or simply show up and spend time with you. But what happens when that promise gets delayed? And they end up and again and again. Soon, you start to wonder if it's ever going to happen at all. Or if you should just give up hope. It's a feeling a lot of us can identify with. And for some of us, it's because we have been waiting on God. In our lives and in our faith, there are a lot of things we wish would happen instantly. There are promises we want to be fulfilled right away, but instead, we have to wait for it. While we wait, we might get frustrated or ask questions. When waiting on God to fulfill a promise, we might wonder, can God really be trusted? Does God really care? If God really loved me, then why do I have to wait so long for it? Well, if you feel like you're waiting on God right now, the good news is that you are not alone. The Bible is filled with stories of people who had to wait on God. Genesis 12, 1 through 3 says, The Lord said to Abraham, Leave your country and your people. Leave your father's family and go to the place that I will show you. I will build a great nation from you. I will bless you and make your name famous. People will use your name to bless others. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who curse you. I will use you to bless all the people on earth. See, Abraham was an ordinary God, but this was no ordinary promise for Abraham. This was a big promise, but there was one small problem. See, Abraham didn't have any descendants. His wife Sarah was unable to have any children, and they were both pretty old. Abraham was stuck waiting to receive what God had promised. He didn't have a timeline or a plan, just a promise. He was officially on the wait list. After years of waiting for a promise from a God they were still learning to trust, I'm pretty sure Abraham and Sarah felt discouraged and impatient. Then finally, after 25 long years of waiting for God's plan to finally come to pass, Sarah gave birth to Isaac, their promised son. See, I don't know what promises you're waiting on right now or what promises you're going to have to wait for in the future, but here's one thing that I do know. God can be trusted. Proverbs 3, 5 through 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him, and he will make your paths straight. Like Abraham, who waited for years for God to give him a child, here's a message you and I often need to hear. God has a plan, but we might have to wait for it. It amazes me because because when God makes a promise, the plan he has in mind is way better than you or I could ever imagine. So what are you waiting for? Something to change in your life? 
someone to change your heart? A prayer to be answered? Well, here's what we can learn from the story of Abraham and Sarah. While we're waiting, God can be trusted. Thank you. What an awesome word. All Abraham had was a promise. I, I want you to know that stuck in my heart. That, that I was here when we had the uh, Fine Arts Festival here, and this young man, Benjamin, shared that word. And I'll tell you, it struck me like, like God just struck me with his hand. All Abraham had was a promise. My brother and sister, all we need is the promise of God. For the word says, all of his promises are yes, and to them we say amen. Let's give this young man a hand. God bless you. Great job. Proud of you. Proud of you. By the way, his grandfather, Brother Darko, is a pastor, longtime pastor in Ghana. Wonderful man. In fact, he was here uh, several months ago and will be back again this month, I believe. And uh, I just want you to know, brother, you're a chip off the old block. Let me rephrase that. You're the chip off the young block. What a word. What a word. So proud of our young people and all of them, not only those that are going to National Fine Arts, but all of our students who use their gifts and talents for the glory of God. I want to welcome you to Brazewood Church. It's good to have you with us this morning. I want to thank you for joining us, especially those of you that are uh, here for the first, second, or third time. And, and I want you to know that we welcome you and are glad that you're here. You'll see on the screen behind me a QR code that you can scan. And if you will scan it and fill out the brief uh, description there or explanation of your visit, we want to know that you're here. We don't want you to just be incognito. We want to know that you're here, not to pressure you in any way, for we would never do that. But if you fill that card out and then take the last page to the um, hospitality suite immediately following the service, that's about five steps right outside these middle doors, turn to your left, and it's right there. There will be people awaiting you with a gift for your visit this morning and a heavenly cup of coffee. And I understand this cup of coffee is even better than it's been before. As Pastor Bruce said, uh, I think it was Sunday, uh, you can call it uh, hev heavenly brew or Hebrew or whatever you want to call it. It's still some of the best coffee you've ever had in your life. And I want to encourage you to do that. We won't take long. We do have a gift that we want to share with you. And for those of you online, we would encourage you to fill out that card if you are a first, second, or third time guest as well, because you honor us by being a part of our service this morning. I have a word for you this morning. First of all, let me just say how much I appreciated our students that were online Wednesday night that gave their gifts and talents to the Lord. I think they deserve a hand. It was an awesome, awesome experience. And not, not just in, in observing, but also in receiving what they had to share with us. We have some of the most gifted and talented young people in this, in this church in, in all across the all across the United States, or in fact, around the world. And I also want to say how much I appreciate Pastor John's message last Sunday. He knocked it out of the park. Home run, grand slam. It was a wonderful, wonderful message, challenged our heart. And then Pastor Bruce Wednesday night brought a, brought a great message, a, a, a thought-provoking message about spiritual maturity. And if you weren't there to witness any of those three messages, then I would encourage you to go online Brazewood Church YouTube, or uh, YouTube, Brazewood Church Media, and you can participate in all of those services, and they were absolutely extraordinary, each and every one. We have some of the most gifted and talented pastors, leaders in this church. I also want to thank Dr. Darlington, who uh, came and picked us up at the airport on Friday. He did, <laughs> and I'll tell you, listen, man, this guy is first class all the way. And we were just so, so excited. Appreciate you so much, Dr. Darlington, for doing that uh, uh, beyond the call of duty, may I say. I, I want to bring a, a short, abbreviated message this morning, just an introduction to a very short series that I want to share with you entitled Woke Christianity. And, and I, I'm, I, it, what's going on in the world today is, is alarming in some way. We're living in a challenging time, and I don't think anyone would argue with that point economically with inflation and all of the things that we're facing today, politically all of the infighting with absolutely or seemingly no unity in our nation politically at all, historically 
in this nation. We are dealing with things we have never dealt with before, not only in the nation, but also in the world. The wars and rumors of wars that are transpiring all over the world, not only with regards to the United States, but in other nations as well, socially. Norms, the norms that have been accepted over the generations, over the years, over the eons of time, are now being challenged right and left. And I must admit to you this morning, I am concerned. It brings me deep concern. But the concern is not for me or necessarily for you, because I believe that we have the maturity to be able to navigate through these waters. We have faith in God, we have trust in God's Word. My greatest concern is for our children. There is a spiritual attack, and make no mistake about it, it is a spiritual attack, not only in this nation, but all over the world. The martyrdom that's happening in nations because of those that proclaim to be Christians is escalating all over the world. But I'm not worried. I am concerned. I readily admit that, but I am not worried because God has a plan. Let me say it again. God has a plan. There's nothing that takes God by surprise. I'm so glad about that. There are things that take me by surprise practically every single day. Things that I face that I wasn't prepared to face or didn't think I'd have to face, or perhaps I thought I'd face it in the future, but not right now. But when those things come, when the adversity comes, when the challenges come, when the questions come, we can rely upon God because God always has a plan always has a plan. And not only does God have the plan for the universe or for the whole world, but God has a plan for your life as well. Specifically your life. The Bible says that God knows you. He knows your name. Isn't that amazing? That with all of the millions of people, billions of people in the world, with all of the, 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 the believers that follow God, He still knows my name. You know, there's sometimes I look in the mirror and have to introduce myself to myself. My wife forgets my name sometimes. Not really, she doesn't. She, but, but the reality of it is God will never forget you. In fact, the Bible says you are the apple of his eye. So that we can declare today, I am God's favorite child. <laughs> you say, well, Pastor Steve, God has no favorites. Yes, he does. Every one of us are his favorites. And he loves us equally as well. And I relax and take comfort in the knowledge that whatever we're going through, or whatever we will face today or in the future, that God has a plan for that specific thing. It did not take him by surprise. In fact, a scripture that I know you're well familiar with, but I'm going to remind you as well, Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11. And I'm going to read it from the message version because I think it really speaks to the issue in a very plain and practical way. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, I, this is God speaking, I know what I'm doing. I love that. I love to be reminded of the fact that God knows what he's doing. As, as Brother Benjamin shared just a, a few moments ago, sometimes we have questions. Sometimes we have to wait. But even in the waiting, we find out, sometimes in retrospect, sometimes as we're waiting, that God has a plan. There's a reason that God has and does what he does. I know what I'm doing. And then he says this. Take comfort in this this morning. He says, I have it all planned out. I have it all planned out. Before you were born, before you drew your first breath, God had a plan for your life. And he says, plans to take care of you and not abandon you. Plans to give you the future that you hope for. So when God says he has a plan, it's not just a general plan. It's a specific plan for your life. And additionally, God's plans are always good. I said God's plans are always good. In fact, not just good, gooder than good, the best. God's plans are always the best in our life. So let me share with you a little bit about God's plans for your life. In Psalms chapter 32, verse 8, it says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way that you should go. And he said, I will counsel you with my eye upon you. God is watching over you every day. With every breath that you breathe, God is watching over you. Luke chapter 19, verse 10 says, For the Son of Man came to seek and save what was lost. And I don't know about you, I grew up in church. In fact, my mother and dad told me that, that perhaps the, the, the week after or the next Sunday after I was born, I was in church. And I've been in church ever since then. Well, there have been a few occasions where I wasn't. But even, even being in a, a pastor's home, I can tell you I didn't serve the Lord all of those years. There were times of great rebellion in my life, times of great wandering from the Lord. In fact, to be very candid with you, hating 
And I use that word specifically hating the church. Literally hating, despising the church. And not feeling too good about God either. But even in that rebellious attitude, even as a prodigal son, God was still working in my life. And even when I was wandering, and and parent, if you have a prodigal in your child, know this, even as they were wandering, even as I was wandering away from the Lord, God was always with me. In fact, that kept me from a lot of problems that I could have encountered in my life because I knew that God was with me. God had a plan. And I want to paraphrase Luke chapter 19, verse 10. It says, here's my paraphrase, and it's my personal. Jesus came specifically to hunt for search for, and go after to rescue, recover, resuscitate those that have lost their way. God isn't casual about his love for us. God is not casual about his desire for us to enter into that relationship with that abiding, deep relationship with him. There is passion in God's love for us, that he would hunt for us, that he would go after us, he would search for us. And search for us, not until he finds us, because he knows where you are every moment, every second of the day, but search for us until we find him in our life. John chapter 3, verse 17, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. God's desire is for every human being on the face of the earth to be born again and to have that personal daily relationship with the Lord. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, a part of God's plan for our life is this. The Holy Spirit will come upon you and give you power or boldness. And you will be my witnesses. You will tell people everywhere about me in Jerusalem, in Judea, the rest of Samaria, and in every part of the world. So God's plan is not only for us, but as we find in Acts chapter 8, God's plan is to flow through us. You are the light of the world. In this dark world, you and I We are the light. I'm absolutely positive that whatever we're navigating through, whatever this nation and world is facing, at any point in time in history or in the future, Jesus is the answer. I say it again. Jesus is the answer. There are no other answers. And those that are searching in so many variety of ways, thinking that they found the answer, will only come to the truth eventually. That is not the answer. So many decisions that have been made or will be made in the future thinking that this is the way, this this will bring me reality, this will bring me hope, this will bring me peace. They will only come to discover, as all of us have in our waywardness, that is not the answer. Those things seem to be secure. Those things seem to be right in the moment, but eventually you come to the truth every single time. What you thought would bring you hope, what you thought would bring you peace, what you thought would be the reality is not reality. The only reality is Jesus Christ. The only satisfying in the world is Jesus Christ. And as you've testified to that in your life, say amen. Amen. He's what brought peace into my life. What brought the greatest sense of reality. Jesus is the answer for the world today. Above him, there's no other. Jesus is the way. Jesus is the answer for the world today. Above him, there's no other. Jesus is the way. I want you to watch this video. This was written by and performed by or ministered by Andre Crouch many, many years ago. But I want you to watch it. And this was done in 1989. I want you to watch this video and listen to the words because they were true in 89 and they're true in 2023 as well. Watch this. Sing it along if you know it.
Amen. Let me, let me just, a, a, quick, a quick note. Andre Crouch visited Braisewood in the 80s, sat right over there, and Don and I were right behind him. And when he walked in and sat down, we, <laughs> we looked at him dumbfounded and thought, is that Andre Crouch? <laughs> and then Dad recognized him and he came. We had the piano over here on this side and he came over and sang a song for us on that time. What a, what a prolific writer, in-depth, simple song. But it was true when it was written in the 80s or 70s, whenever he wrote it, and it's just as true today. And that's something we should never forget. Something we, as believers in Christ, those that are Christ followers, that we must embrace Jesus, and Jesus alone is the answer. The answer is not going to be found in politics. I've said that many times before. It's not going to be found in politics, not going to be found in laws, not going to be found in trying to regulate people's morality. Jesus is the answer to every question. In fact, when I was in college, I took a philosophies class, and this professor was a, I don't know what he was in terms of his faith or lack thereof, but, but he would rail on, and this was in the 70s, he would rail on Christians every single class. It was a Monday, Wednesday, Friday class, one hour, and he would rail against Christians, I mean over and over and I was just giving my life back to the Lord at that time and very timid about my faith. And he would make this statement. He said, people would come up to me, similar to this, similar to this song, people would come up to me, he would say, and say, Jesus is the answer. And he said, i got a question for you. If Jesus is the answer, what is the question? And it was an accusatory statement. And I wish I had the boldness then that I have now because I think I would stand up and say, he's the answer to every question. But I was timid and didn't do what I should have done back in the day. When I was growing up, we fought labels. We literally fought against labels. Don't label me. That was our mantra. Don't label me. Don't put a label on me. We would say, Again, we were young. I'm not a Democrat. I'm not a Republican. I'm not a Libertarian. I don't vote for the party, we would say. I vote for the person. But not anymore. Not where we are today. We fought to be individuals and to be the individual that we were. And at the same time that we demanded individualism, we gave in to pressures that came to bear. But we made a demand. I am an individual. I am who I am, we would proclaim. But now, today, we label everyone, and we label everything. Black, Hispanic, Asian, African, white, indigenous peoples. We give titles along religious lines, age, politics, socioeconomic, non-Christian faiths, unaffiliated, even deconstructionists, which is a, it's not a new movement, but it has a new name, a new title, if you will. People that are now prodigals who once had a faith in God, had a relationship with the Lord, and some of them an in-depth relationship, but over time, however it came, they now question their faith. And many have abandoned their faith. Many have walked away. In fact, not only have they abandoned their faith, but now they are the evangelist of deconstruction as well, encouraging others to do the same. But they're prodigals, and my prayer is they will come back. They will come back. They will see that the world doesn't hold peace. The world doesn't hold hope. They'll come back to the one that they love. Now we are even fight, fighting social norms in dealing with sexual labels as well. There are gender identity, gender queer, cisgender, transgender, gender transition, non-binary, agender, and a couple I didn't know, two-spirit genders, third gender, and pangender. And then there's a new one that's just come out. I just, just read this morning. It's about people who, and, and I don't remember the name of it, but it's people who want to be, oh, what's the word? Um, they want limbs amputated. They want eyes taken out. They 
they identify with people who have disabilities, healthy people. My brother and sister, we live in a sick, sick, sick world. It's sick. It's delusional. I mean, in true reality, it is a delusion. But hear me, it is growing. It is growing. And it's growing among our young people. Some of us in this room have had encounters with family members that are dealing with these very issues, that have, that have fallen into doubt, question, and, and even embracing some of these things. We are becoming a fractured nation. But not only that, we're becoming fractured people, broken people, becoming fractured families. Some of these issues have brought deep, deep crevices of relationship or broken relationships within families. And my brother and sister, I want you to know this as well. We are becoming a fractured church. The church is dealing with this issue. And some have embraced it wholeheartedly. But I'm here to tell you, if we're going to do anything, if we're going to evaluate anything, we evaluate it by the Word of God. That's the basis. For the Word of God is truth. But understand this. Regardless of what label people put upon themselves or others place upon them, Jesus loves them all. Jesus loves them all. Remember this simple verse when you were growing up, perhaps one of the first verses that you memorized as a child, John 3.16. Unfortunately, often that's where we stop, John 3.16. But I want us to read 3.16, 17, and 18 to find the context of verse 16. This is it. Verse 16, I'm reading from the Message Version. This is how much God loved the world that he gave his son, his one and only son, and this is why. Now he's given us a reason, not only that he did this, but why he did this. So that no one need be destroyed. By believing in him, anyone can have whole and lasting life. And that's typically where we stop. But verse 17 says, God didn't go to all the trouble of sending his son merely to point an accusing finger telling people how bad the world is. He came to help to put the world right again. Anyone who trusts him is acquitted, blameless, cleared, released, in the clear, not guilty, paid in full. And anyone who refuses to trust him has long since been under death sentence without knowing it. And why? Because of that person's failure to believe in that one-of-a-kind Son of God when introduced to him. That's why Jesus came. He didn't come to point an accusing finger. The question then to address is how do we respond to all of this that is going on in the world today? How do we respond to the wokeism that is facing us each day? And I want to first tell you what will not work. Heated confrontation will not work. Human intellectual debate will not work. Finger pointing or finger wagging will not work. Hatred disdain. None of that will work. That will never change somebody's heart in life. That will never change someone's future. I can tell you what will not work. Hiding the truth will not work. Attempting to change the truth to fit someone's agenda will not work. Now that cuts both ways, my friends. Not only change the truth to fit somebody's agenda that's opposed to ours, but changing the truth to fit our own agenda as well. We don't change the truth, we embrace the truth. We don't change the truth, we live the truth. I can tell you what will not work, a spirit of self-righteousness will not work. Jesus never responded to people that way. The key question to address how we should respond to all of this To know that when Jesus was on this earth, he would have been considered a woke person. Maybe woke is a wrong word. He would have been considered a rebel. In fact, he was considered a rebel. One of the reasons why the religious crowd was so opposed to Jesus is because he challenged everything they believed, everything they held to be truth. Luke chapter 4, verse 18 and 19 says this. And this is Jesus speaking, sitting down in the temple, Opening the book, and isn't it interesting that as the book was open, it came across this word. That was no accident, my friend. That was one of those miracles that take place. 
I don't think Jesus searched through the book to find this verse. I think when he opened it, that's the verse he opened it to because that's the word that God wanted the people to hear. And not only the people of that day, but you and me to hear as well. Jesus said, speaking of the prophet, prophesying these words in advance, Jesus saying, now I am the fulfillment. Here's what he said. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the who? The poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom to who? The prisoners. To recovery sight for the blind, the impaired. And to set the oppressed free. And to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Each and every one of these were people that were marginalized. These were people that were looked down upon. That considered of no value to society whatsoever. These were outcasts. The, yet, the Bible says those are the very ones that Jesus came to save. The ones, the scripture we read before, that he was searching for, that he was in, in, in hunting for their life. These were the ones that were considered lesser important. Lest we become like the Pharisees and Sadducees, we think our righteousness is above the life of everyone else, or that in and of ourselves we are better than anyone else. I want to tell you, my friend, if you have a self-righteous spirit, you don't have the Spirit of God in you. If you know God, it's not about self-righteousness, it's about God's righteousness and the righteousness of Jesus Christ that is in us because we are children of the Lord, not because we were right and God chose us, but because He loved us and we submitted to His love. Reality of that truth. You, you, you take the most despicable person that ever walked on the face of the earth and they are no different than you and me except the grace and the mercy of God that we accept it into our heart and our life. Jesus came as a rebel in the eyes of the religious crowd, came as a rebel and they cast him out. And furthermore, not only did they cast him out, they killed him because of his message. And let me give you an example of what works. When you're dealing with those that are so confused, so delusional, so in pain, John chapter 4, verse 5 through 9 talks about Jesus talking to a Samaritan woman. I'm not going to read the whole scripture. But in his dealing with a Samaritan woman, as he came and he sat down and he asked her for something very simple, just to drink of water. How innocent, just to drink of water. Can I tell you something? People respond to the way we respond to them. When we respond with anything other than the love of Jesus Christ, we've already shut the door. You, you have to earn the right to speak into somebody's life. You, you, don't, you don't have the right in their mind. You don't have the right to speak into their life just because you're a believer. In fact, in reality, many times before we speak, we ought to act like a believer. Before we speak a word, we ought to, we ought to display the very nature of Jesus Christ in our life. And by doing that, give credence to the words that we speak. She asked him, he said, you a Jew, you're asking me, not only a woman, but a Samaritan woman, you're asking me for a drink of water? That would have been unheard of. In fact, the Bible says, for Jews have no dealing with Samaritans. And that was a historical event that took place under the Roman occupation, the splitting of the, of the, of, of, of the kingdom of Israel. And the, and the Samaritans married into with what they thought were infidels or heathens and gave in to the Roman rule or Roman law and were considered rebellious outcasts by the Jew. And here Jesus is having a confrontation with a woman. That's no different than one of us having an interaction with somebody that was a part of some of the things I've read a moment ago that we look at and we think this is just bizarre. These people are weird. And by the way, they probably think you're weird too. Am I right? Sure. People, I, I won't get into that, that, that's another day. But, but he encountered her, and what did, he, did he lecture her? No. Did he point out her sins? Not at the beginning. Only when she realized that there was something different about this man did he know that she was not living as she should, as she knew she should. So Jesus answered her and said, Everyone who drinks this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks the water that I will give him shall never thirst. But that water that I will give him will become in him a well of water springing to eternal life. Wow. 
That, that touched her curiosity, didn't it? And she said, I want some of that water. And she was thinking in terms of drawing a well, the work that was required to draw the water. No longer have to work. But she, he gained her attention. And then the Bible says at the very end, he did confront her sin. He, he, he confronted her waywardness. And, re, and, and understand this, he didn't make excuses for it. In fact, every encounter that Jesus had with those that were not walking in the way of righteousness, he confronted them with that, talked about them, but not in a sense of casting them. You see, there's sometimes that Christians, not a brazewood, we never do this, but Christians feel you're going to hell and I'm kind of glad you're going to hell. You're a sinner, you're lost, and I'm kind of glad you're lost. That's kind of the attitude that some believers have, but not Jesus. For the scripture says he went after those that were poor. He went after those that were outcast. In fact, the, the most brutal, the most significant um, criticism that he gave were not of those that were sinners who had lost their way, but those that knew better and had lost their way. The Sadducees and Pharisees, the religious crowd. I've got so much more to say, and I've got to stop. But the reality of it is, is this. Let me jump to my point. The Samaritan woman at the well did not need a lecture about how evil she was. She did not need to have the truth bent to fit her experience or her truth. She did not need to have a public debate about versions of truth. She needed an encounter with Jesus Christ. That's what she needed. She needed a true encounter with with a Savior who loved her. Logic of your argument will not change someone. The passion of your emotion will not change anyone. Our moral outrage will not change anyone. What people need today is an encounter with a Savior who loved them in spite of their sin, in spite of their waywardness, in spite of their delusions. People need to see Jesus in you and me. You cannot mandate an encounter you cannot force an encounter. All you can do is lead someone to encounter with Jesus. So my word for us today at the beginning of this message is this. We must be awake, not woke. We must be awake. And by awake, I mean spiritually awake. We must know Jesus, know his nature, know his spirit, and be that light that he's called us to be. Colossians 2, 8, 9 says, See that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and elemental spiritual forces in this world rather than on Christ. For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form, and in Christ you have been, bought, you have been brought to fullness. He is the head over every power and over every authority. We're in a spiritual battle, and it is a fierce battle. The battle for our nation is not the most important battle that we fight, but the battle rages for the soul of our children. There is a battle for our children. And mom and dad, it's time we awaken to that battle. Grandpa and grandmas, papas and nanas, it's time we awaken to that battle. And be vigilant and be aware. It's not personal against you. It's not a fight against you. It's not a fight against Democrats or Republicans or Libertarians. It's a spiritual battle. Ephesians 6.12 says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers and against authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. And if you try to fight this battle in the flesh, you'll be wounded. Let me say that again. If you try to fight this battle in the flesh, with intellect, with logic, or whatever else, you will be wounded. But if you fight in the spirit, you will be victorious because Jesus is the answer. The next Sunday, I'm going to share this truth. It's time to wake up, get up, step up, and step out in Jesus' name. So here's our challenge. God has called each and every one of us to be the light, the light of Christ in your maximum impact environment. That is the strategic place that God has placed you, be it in school, university, junior high, senior high, home, work, wherever it is that we live. And allow the light of Jesus to break through the arguments for sin. People need to see Jesus in us. 
the first Jesus that they'll see and witness. Many of them will be the Jesus that they see in us. And people need to see Jesus. You cannot mandate an encounter. You cannot force an encounter with Christ. All you can do is lead people to an encounter with Jesus Christ. And to those of you here this morning that, and online that may not have a personal relationship, daily relationship with the Lord, not religion, not denomination, not church, but a relationship, a living daily relationship with the Lord. My question to you is this. What does the story of your life look like right now? What does your life look like right now? Whatever you're pursuing or have pursued, whatever you're looking for to bring substance to your life, what does your life look like right now? And my word to you today, if you're searching, if you're looking, God can change the story of your life. And not only can he change the story, he wants to change the story of your life. And he'll accept you just the way that you are. That's the beauty of my Father. As Jesus, as he was ministering on this earth, living on this earth, he accepted people just the way that they were, but he never leave them the way that he found them. He always brought change and transformation into their life. Psalms 34, verse 17 and 19 says, Is anyone crying for help? God will listen. God is ready to rescue you. If your heart is broken, you'll find God right there. And if you're kicked in the gut, he'll help you catch your breath. Disciples so often get into trouble. Still, God is there every time. And the charge to each and every one of us as the service ends and concludes is show the world the changed story of your life. Be that open book. People are reading us every day. They're watching us every day. And the minute you tell you're a Christian, there are eyes on you. Live that life that God's called us to live. And display Christ's love, even sometimes when it has to be a sacrifice on our part, to display the very love of Christ. And be that authentic voice of God's love everywhere you go, everyone you encounter in your life. And throughout the week, expect your miracle. God has a miracle with your name on it, custom made just for you. Can I hear an amen? It's time to receive the Lord's tithes and offerings. Somebody give